Okay, welcome to uh, Lecture 15. I apologize that it's been uh, delayed in its posting a little bit, um, but I really was exhausted last night after way too much driving, and so it's going to be much, much better for me. I'm feeling a lot more lucid and coherent now than I was uh, after six and a half hours of driving yesterday. So hopefully uh, the lecture will uh, be better for the slight delay, but I apologize, of course, for any inconvenience. So from the beginning of the course, I've stressed that the topic of individual freedom emancipation from oppression, from slavery. Uh, that's a major uh, theme in all modern Western uh, political theory. Um, and it's come up at various points in uh, uh, what we've already read, even in Hobbes, who many regard as the arch enemy of individual uh, freedom. Even he has an analysis of the concept of uh, individual freedom. And he says, look, even if you're living under a uh, uh, an authoritarian, terrifying Leviathan state, you're still free to the extent that the sovereign uh, allows you the freedom uh, to do as you please within the silence uh, of the law. Uh, so even he has uh, a, a, an account of freedom and recognizes to some degree um, uh, its importance. Uh, but the theme was, of course, even more prominent in Locke, uh, with an idea of sort of voluntariness around which his entire theory uh, uh, revolves, and of course in Rousseau, with this commitment to individual independence, uh, the idea that uh, you should be no one's master, um, and the idea that one's own political society should be independent in that same sense, should be self-determining, um, and it ought to try uh, to identify its own general uh, will um, and will be free to the extent that it acts only on a will that is genuinely its own as opposed to that of some alien force. So we've already uh, encountered uh, thinkers here who are committed to the idea of individual freedom um, and indeed to some degree to an idea of uh, uh, the freedom of a community. Um, but we come in the next two lectures now to one of the absolute classic works in the defense of uh, individual freedom in the modern Western tradition, uh, John Stuart Mill's uh, 1859 text uh, on liberty. A wonderful, a wonderful text. Many of you will have read it before, uh, but it definitely repays many, many rereadings. I and mean, I've been teaching this this piece for uh, much of my career, and every time I reread it, there's something new I find. Uh, it's it's a tremendously fertile, rich uh, um, uh, uh, text. As you know, uh, Mill dedicates this text to his wife Harriet, who very sadly died just the year before it was uh, published. But Mill makes it clear that both in terms of emotional inspiration and actual concrete collaboration, uh, Harriet was an important player in the composition uh, of this piece. Uh, very difficult for us to know how many of the arguments in On Liberty uh, uh, are due to her rather than to uh, John Stewart, uh, but there's absolutely no doubt uh, that she uh, was uh, played a formative role uh, in the in, in this text, and so uh, what you're reading is as much her input likely um, as John Stewart's. The same is true, by the way, of uh, one of uh, Mill's other great works on the subjection of women, published about a decade after On Liberty, um, and in, and one of the really only great feminist tracts written in the Western tradition by a white male. I mean, obviously, feminist works before this, uh, but uh, really, Mill is the first. Uh, is the first man to stick his head above the parapet and really um, uh, 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 endorse a strong feminist uh, manifesto. But that book too, although it took uh, 10 years to finish after Harriet's death, again, it's clear that a lot of the arguments are owed to conversations um, uh, and discussions that he had with Harriet and that, as he says, the, the content of the book uh, bears her imprint uh, uh, very, very heavily. Uh, so keep that, uh, keep that in mind. But in On Liberty, uh, uh, the question that Mill and Harriet ask themselves is an absolutely basic, although of course a very difficult and complicated one. Uh, they want to ask, what are the limits of society's rights to control individuals' lives? Focuses on individual freedom, not so much the freedom of the state or of a political community, as in Rousseau. Uh, uh, the focus is on individual freedom, and the focus is on how free individuals should be from interference at the hands of uh, the legal system, um, and also by more inf from more informal methods uh, of control and coercion uh, and oppression. That's also going to be an important theme in uh, On Liberty.
Now, as you know, because uh, we talked about this in the last lecture, Mill broadly accepts uh, the standard classical liberal Hobbes Locke claim that the modern state's overriding responsibility is to protect security of person and property. And you might say, well, why does he, he's already said this in chapter five of, of utilitarianism, uh, why does he need a whole other book about liberty? Right? Isn't this enough? I mean, after all, a state that protects our property, uh, that uh, prevents us from uh, uh, being uh, assaulted and raped and secures our person, right? I mean, all of these things uncontroversially uh, are part of what it means for us to be individually free. Um, Mill clearly accepts all of this. Why does he just, why doesn't he just leave it at that? Uh, but it's fairly clear that Mill and Harriet think that more needs to be said. Uh, and I think that what's motivating them uh, are two main considerations, the second of which is quite explicit, uh, the first of which uh, uh, is a little bit more me imputing uh, a set of concerns to them. Uh, the first has to do with uh, the character of the concept of security, right? Um, we all agree on certain standard cases where a person's security is under threat, right? If you're mugged, if you're stolen from, if you're intimidated, physically bullied, raped, assaulted, then your security is under threat. If somebody steals your junk, uh, again, we all agree that these are both um, uh, uh, assaults on your security and also assaults on your freedom, right? Um, but the idea of security um, is not necessarily always so easily confinable to these clear cases. It's a kind of accordion concept that can sometimes be expanded into many other areas, right? Um, and we see this today with people worrying about the security state, and they worry about a trade-off between national security and personal freedom with regard to secrecy and uh, 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 probing into your private affairs and screening your internet activity, you know, Edward Snowden and Julian Assange and all of these people, right? Uh, but we've seen this worry going all the way back, really, to Hobbes, right? Because Hobbes recognizes it right at the ground level. Uh, Hobbes says, look, um, uh, security is a contested concept. What it means to promote my security is not something we can straightforwardly settle, right? And in a state of nature, each of us would uh, interpret our own security in our own way. Um, and that would allow us, in principle, permit us to uh, predate on others for preemptive reasons, to, to, to protect ourselves and secure our self-preservation. And in Hobbes's political theory, we see this expansionary conception of security uh, gravitating in his settled uh, political theory to the hair-raising claim that a state committed to security uh, uh, can, uh, uh, and indeed is authorized, to do all sorts of things that we would regard as threats uh, to security, namely to control thought, to control religion, to control speech, to control the education process. Um, this suggests that security doesn't have a kind of self-limiting property. Rather, it has a, it's a value that, that doesn't necessarily um, uh, 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 keep itself under control. And I think Mill is, 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 is quite uh, 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 aware of that problem, and it's part of his motivation uh, for uh, writing on liberty. He wants, he wants certainly to secure people, but he wants to make sure that we don't understand security in too expansionary a way so that it becomes an excuse to actually uh, limit people's freedom in various ways. And of course, again, he doesn't say this explicitly, perhaps because he can't, but surely it's in the back of his mind, some level. As a card-carrying utilitarian, Mill is, of course, committed to a philosophical position that doesn't seem to have any obvious, uh, in-principle uh, scruple about these kinds of expansions, right? There's nothing in the greatest happiness principle that prohibits on principle brainwashing, indoctrination, thought control, uh, technocratic paternalism. If human beings are going to be happier um, if we, as in Brave New World, you know, give them uh, 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 various mind-altering substances and completely uh, control their thinking, uh, uh, re-indoctrinate them and so forth, uh, if that's what makes human beings happier, then the greatest happiness principle is going to actually recommend that. Um, and, of course, uh, many of the critiques of utilitarianism in the 19th and 20th century have taken the form of dystopian uh, 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 speculation like Brave New World, right? Um, that, you know, utilitarianism is just going to lead to uh, a world in which we're subject to complete control by paternalist, technocratic, um, 
uh, reformers, like people like B.F. Skinner, right, who probably not really a, a utilitarian, but certainly he was a technocrat, and he certainly believed in using uh, 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 sanctions in the Benthamite sense to control and reinforce behavior. And of course, in 1971, B.F. Skinner writes this famous book uh, saying called Beyond Freedom and, D and Dignity. And what he's saying is, look, we need to, to get rid of all of this uh, superstitious hokum about individual freedom. Uh, that's all just pre-scientific superstitious bullshit. Uh, we need to get that, usher that off the stage so that we can have a rigorous program of technocratic behaviorist uh, reform, right? Again, that's not itself a utilitarian view. Skinner probably himself wouldn't have described himself as a utilitarian, but it's not clear why there's anything in classical utilitarianism that forbids that. Yeah, and indeed you might think there's a lot of uh, stuff in utilitarianism that pushes uh, a utilitarian uh, in that direction. And of course, anyone who's a friend of freedom might find that feature of utilitarianism uh, deeply disturbing. Uh, the other reason why I think Mill thinks uh, we need to say more about freedom than just let's just protect our basic rights um, is that Mill has uh, a deep ambivalence about the march towards democratization, which uh, he sees occurring in the uh, 19th century. I mean, on the one hand, of course, he's a big fan, right? I mean, we're still a long way, of course, from the universal franchise. Women haven't gotten the vote yet. Um, and he and also Harriet advocated very strongly uh, for women's suffrage in the middle of the 19th century. So we're not there yet, uh, but the franchise is widening. And especially since the uh, French Revolution, uh, the push for greater democratic accountability um, has ga gained ground and, and, and shows no sign of going away. And in general, Mill is a huge fan of this because he recognizes uh, in a broadly Lockean vein uh, that uh, de demo demo promoting democratic accountability is a vital way to check uh, tyrants, to, to uh, limit the extent to which uh, rulers uh, of states abuse their power. Um, and he's all in favor of in, uh, uh, these kinds of checks, right? He doesn't, he, he, he thinks the, 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 the push towards democratization is very, very healthy uh, for that reason. But on the other hand, as you know, and this is quite explicit in the text, he's also worried uh, that uh, democratization could become a new threat uh, to individual freedom. He's worried about the possibility uh, of an idea he gets from Tocqueville, the worry about the tyranny uh, of the majority, right? That the, the, the majority, uh, once it feels its power through uh, legislation, through the democratic process, uh, might be in a position uh, to shove unwelcome doctrines and social practices down the throats of minority uh, dissenters. Um, and he's worried that uh, we've, we may be replacing one form of tyranny, the tyranny of monarchs um, and unaccountable aristocrats and oligarchs, with a new kind of tyranny, the tyranny of democratic uh, majorities. And he's, it's important to emphasize here that he's concerned not just with uh, legal interference uh, through democratic legislation. He's also worried about the change in atmosphere uh, uh, that uh, d d democratization uh, may bring, right? Uh, he's already alive to uh, the development of what we would today call public opinion, right? Uh, uh, a, a kind of gradual collective sense of where we all, what right-minded, ordinary members of the public think, right? And he's deeply suspicious uh, of that sort of um, uh, common sense self-righteousness about where we all ought morally to be uh, uh, standing, right? Um, and he's acutely aware in Victorian times that there is this captious, uh, 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 this, this ca ca captious is a great word. It, it, me it means uh, picking at people's faults, right? The kind of people who you know tell you that you've put your knife and fork the wrong way around on the when, when you lay the table, uh, or in a country club who 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 tell you that you're not wearing the right kind of uh, jacket, or that you need to wear a tie, otherwise you're not welcome, right? Um, these are all more informal ways in which individual freedom can be restricted, um, in which people are subject to various kinds of informal sanctions, um, and he's worried that democratic public opinion can become a, a much more powerful. Uh, source of that sort of informal uh, coercion. Uh, Mill felt this uh, directly in his own life, uh, as you may know, when he initially fell in love with Harriet, uh, she was already married to somebody else. She was married to a man called John Taylor. 
Um, and uh, John Taylor was remarkably magnanimous about this um, and actually allowed, knew perfectly well that they were in love. He wasn't, wasn't, wasn't adult, he wasn't stupid, could see it as you often can. Um, uh, and he actually allowed John Stewart and Harriet to hang out together with him away. He would go off gambling and say, why don't you go hang out by, them, by yourselves? Not completely clear what, what they got up to. Uh, most accounts are that there was uh, nothing, it was all platonic at that point. But nonetheless, it's clear that uh, there was emotional infidelity involved in Harriet's attitudes towards John Stewart because they were deeply uh, in love regardless of anything physical that happened. Uh, when John Taylor died a few years later, of course, Mill and Harriet were able to marry. Um, but both before and after John Taylor's death, um, Mill felt very harsh disapproval from his Victorian contemporaries who regarded both the arrangement before John Taylor died and also his decision to marry someone who'd previously been married, uh, they regarded his behavior as really not cricket and, and he was made to feel uh, ostracized and belittled by that. So, he, so he's, he's keenly aware of the way in which these sorts of informal social controls uh, can affect people and limit personal freedom. And he's worried that democratization may actually make that problem worse. Now, partly for that reason, Mill makes a very important early move in uh, On Liberty, which I think is very important for you to appreciate. Mill refuses to frame questions about individual freedom and individual liberty in the following form. He refuses to ask the question, uh, which, for example, would have occurred straightforwardly to someone like Plato or Aristotle, because this is precisely the way uh, the classical uh, political philosophers thought about uh, uh, politics, uh, though they weren't often thinking about liberty, it's true. Uh, uh, he refuses to uh, confront the question or pass it as some version of which opinions about how individuals ought to live, about what kinds of patterns of life should command our approval or disapproval, right? Which substantive views about the good life, about who's living life well and who's doing it badly, right? Which are the correct ones to choose for the purposes of deciding when to impose limits on individual freedom, right? He says that to frame the question that way, which of course is very tempting, um, is in fact the wrong way to frame the question, because, he says, it begs the question of individual uh, liberty. It skips over, without really answering, an important step. Um, it leaves, as he puts it, unassailed an underlying assumption, which is that the likings and dislikings of society, or some powerful portion of it, as he puts it, should determine the rules laid down for general observance, under the penalties of law or opinion. That is, if you approach the question that way, you're presupposing that we, the community, uh, uh, has a right to decide what we want to go on around here. And then simply, once we've decided which conception of the good we want to select, then, it, then, then, then we automatically get, because, because we're the democratic majority or we're the voice of uh, uh, tradition or something like that, we, we just get to then impose it on everybody else, right? And that, Mill thinks, skips a step. It, it, it skips a step. It begs the question, which is for him the question of liberty. Sorry, I need to calm down, probably causing all sorts of distortion on the mic. Um, instead of asking, Mill says, and this is again from page 156 of your Troyer reader, instead of asking, what should we like or dislike? What should we morally approve of or morally disapprove of? We should instead focus on the question of whether and when the likings or dislikings of different portions of society should be a law to others, right? Whether they authorize legal or other kinds of interference with individual uh, spontaneity and freedom of choice, right? That's the right way to frame the question. And in general, Mill thinks that the question has not been asked in that correct way enough in the modern period. He does note, however, an important exception. He says there is one area in which we've started to think more correctly about individual freedom, um, and that perhaps uh, surprisingly is in the religious sphere, right? In the aftermath of the Reformation, uh, the Christian tradition has fragmented into a thousand shards of, of different dissenting congregations, different denominations. 
right? Um, and of course, at the time when Hobbes and Locke are writing, they're still engaged in uh, political and uh, 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 open combat, uh, often on the battlefield over which vision of Christianity uh, uh, should survive uh, or, sh or should prevail. Um, but as Mill knows, by the time we get to the 19th century, gradually the Christian tradition has kind of come to its senses and started to realize um, as Hobbes had already anticipated, and as Locke had certainly uh, thought in some of his writings on toleration, there is always going to be disagreement about how to interpret the Gospels. Right? We are not finally going to be able to agree. So uh, the Christian community is going to be diverse, and we have to accept that. Um, and rather than continue to fight over our uh, uh, disagreements and, and our internal pluralism, we need to accept some general principles about freedom of conscience and promote ecumenical tolerance across uh, denominations. Right? And Mill thinks that's a model for us to generalize. He thinks that this uh, uh, demonstrates the maturation uh, of the Christian tradition from one of dogmatic uh, uh, and ultimately fruitless um, self-certainty to uh, a, a stage in which Christianity has started to recognize the limits of its own powers to, to secure uniformity and conformity. And the, the Christian tradition has started to recognize, in the end of the day, tolerance is what we need, right? And tolerance means uh, allowing that different opinions about the meaning of the Gospels cannot simply be regarded as mandatory for every member of the Christian uh, communion, right? We have to recognize that there's got to be latitude and freedom for different dissenting uh, denominations to uh, interpret the Gospels and interpret the meaning of piety in their own ways. And Mill thinks that's a tremendously valuable development uh, and it needs to be generalized. And that's one way to think about what he's doing in uh, uh, On Liberty. But he thinks that to apply the model of religious toleration more broadly across the board as a general formula for protecting individuals and their liberty, we need a clear principle. We need a test by which, as he puts it, the propriety of especially government interference is customarily tested. Um, and as you know, uh, uh, On Liberty makes a concrete proposal along these lines. This is his famous harm principle, the sole end for which mankind are warranted individually or collectively in interfering uh, with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. The only purpose which power can rightfully be exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient uh, warrant. And the harm principle is clearly a liberty promoting principle because uh, what it says, and here I'm just quoting from Mill on the next page of your Troia, on page 159, um, uh, it says, subjection of individual spontaneity to external control is legitimate and authorizable, quote, only in respect to those actions of each which concern the interests of others, right? It's only harm to others that should be in view when we ask ourselves a question, what kinds of interferences can we legitimately place uh, on individual uh, freedom of choice? So that's, the, that's going to be the proposal about which I'll say uh, more in the next lecture. Um, notice a couple of things uh, before we go any further. Uh, Mill quite explicitly, and in a way completely unsurprisingly given his uh, credentials as a utilitarian, refuses to defend the harm principle on the grounds of abstract uh, right, right. He is not arguing here that I am entitled to my freedom in the sense that I have a right to be left alone, right? That that that, that just sits there uh, as a kind of natural right. Uh, his case for the harm principle uh, is intended to be utilitarian in character, as he says, uh, invoking lots of the things we talked about earlier with the higher pleasures, grounded on the permanent interests of man as a progressive claim. Uh, sorry, as a, as a progressive being. So his claim is that upholding the harm principle um, is not something that we are duty bound to do by anyone's abstract or natural rights to freedom of thought, right? Uh, rather, he wants to think about freedom of thought, freedom of speech, uh, free experimentation, uh, uh, 
experiments and living and so forth. He wants to think of those things as having utilitarian value, right? Not a straightforward right, right? Even though they may be protected by legal rights, right? So his claim is that upholding the harm principle will tend to maximize the welfare of everyone, um, indulging the temptation to restrict personal freedom for reasons other than the prevention of harm, to, to turn it around, uh, is uh, for him a losing gambit as far as overall happiness is concerned. So keep in mind, although he's making a really strong principle defense of individual freedom, uh, Mill is not, not departing at all, at least in his own mind, uh, from a utilitarian framework. He's not deserting it for some tacit kind of Lockean appeal to uh, an individual natural right to freedom. That's not the way this is supposed to work uh, uh, at all. You might ask, well, what does Mill mean by liberty? And I just want to say quickly one uh, quick thing about this. Remember our uh, contrast, which I mentioned in the lectures on Hobbes, between positive and negative uh, liberty, right? Negative liberty uh, or theorists of negative liberty are concerned fundamentally with the question of what interferences stand in the way of an agent's external choices, right? It's a matter of how the environment is configured so as to make available certain options or close them off or interfere with them. That's what theorists of negative liberty are fundamentally concerned about. Um, then there's this positive liberty uh, 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 tradition, which is uh, exemplified especially in this course by someone like Rousseau, which is less concerned with external interferences and much more with the question of who is in control. It's much more of an internal question about who's in charge. Um, and I'm free to the extent that I'm the one who determines uh, uh, how I'm going to behave, uh, not some external or alien force, right? I'm the one in control, right? So the positive liberty tradition is concerned with who is in control. The negative liberty tradition is, is concerned with what in the outside world is in fact interfering with various possible things a person might want to do, right? That's the basic contrast, just to remind you. Uh, Mill's argument is mainly, obviously, about negative liberty because his concern is with lifting uh, legal and informal interferences, right? Uh, uh, the, the question that the harm principle is supposed to answer is when, way, when may we restrict freedom of action? When may we place legal interferences and obstacles in the path of possible modes of life, right? So uh, Mill is still, I think, broadly more in the Hobbesian tradition when it comes to conceptualizing freedom. But uh, I also think that it would be wrong to say that some elements of, of uh, positive liberty thinking are entirely absent from his view, because uh, as you'll see, and as you probably already know, um, uh, he defends his harm principle for the sake of promoting a, an ideal of individual autonomy and self-direction, right? It's very, very important for Mill that we live our lives as we wish to live them. Um, and he thinks that has all sorts of uh, personal and also utilitarian uh, advantages, uh, and that's partly what he is um, uh, trying to get at. And insofar as uh, that's a, an element in his argument, he's clearly recruiting at least some implicit uh, positive liberty ideas about who's in control uh, and about personal autonomy. So, so keep keep that in mind. Um, he, he, he's got a complex uh, view of freedom, though in the first instance, and officially, when he uses the language of liberty in this text, he's mainly thinking about liberty in Hobbesian terms, in terms of the absence uh, and lifting of possible obstacles to personal uh, uh, choices. Now, in the next lecture, I'm going to uh, review the harm principle itself, uh, uh, think about what it actually uh, means uh, and how it's supposed to work, um, because although it looks obvious, it turns out that it's actually kind of a complicated principle and, and, and its implications are not as clear as you might initially uh, uh, think. Uh, so I'll talk about that, uh, those details about the harm principle and how Mill intends it uh, in the next uh, lecture, our last lecture on Mill. Uh, in the remainder of today's lecture, I, I want to focus on this uh, claim uh, that Mill makes that lifting restrictions on voluntary individual choices, except when they harm others, um, has a powerful utilitarian uh, 
uh, justification. Uh, what does that utilitarian justification look like? What are some of the questions you might raise about it? That's the focus for the rest of this lecture. And as you know, I'm sure, uh, the main elements of Mill's argument for this uh, uh, claim, this utilitarian defense uh, of the harm principle and of freedom of speech and, and, and individual liberty and so forth, they're mainly contained in chapters two and three of On Liberty. Uh, that, that's where you want to mainly look for Mill's general arguments for the alleged utilitarian benefits of liberty that he thinks the harm principle uh, would guarantee if we followed it. So just to give you a sense of the architecture here, uh, what chapter two does is to take an individual case uh, one that he thinks is already fairly well understood because, of course, freedom of thought and discussion had already had uh, a lot of uh, uh, advocates in the Anglophone tradition. Think of somebody like Milton in the Are Areopagitica, for example. Um, uh, Mill thinks that the case for liberty of thought and discussion is already fairly well understood. So he starts there, although, of course, he wants to uh, uh, expand it into a much more systematic argument uh, for why efforts to control thought and belief and to suppress speech uh, and to limit educational freedom to explore different kinds of ideas, uh, why those sorts of efforts to control typically produce negative social consequences that any utilitarian would want to uh, uh, prevent uh, in the name of, of human happiness. Um, having talked about that sort of general case for liberty of thought and discussion in chapter two, uh, chapter three then extends the argument in a particular direction. Right. He says, well, you know, it's not enough just to have rational beliefs and to be free to kind of express yourself and to argue with one another in various ways about how we might live. Right. That's to keep everything still at a rather intellectual uh, level, just at the level of discourse. Right. I mean, often what we're talking about here um, are not just theoretical beliefs. They're not just beliefs about the way the universe is structured. You know, we're not just having discussions about uh, string theory or uh, the or cosmology or the Big Bang, uh, uh, that sort of thing. We're also having discussions about how we ought to live together and how, how we ought to approach the problems uh, of life. And so what chapter three does is to say, is to extend the argument about liberty of thought into uh, the domain of private action, right? And so what he wants to say is, look, it, it, it's, if, you've, if you're following me so far, then, we, then you should agree that people should be free to explore ideas and beliefs freely in discussion and in thought and in the educational setting. Um, but that's only going to get you so far because uh, what you also want to do is to let individuals have the courage of their intellectual convictions and then actually carry through in their action what they want to experiment with on the basis of these discussions, right? They must be free, he wants to say, uh, to carry their opinions into practice at their own uh, cost. And what chapter three is attempting, trying to, is, is, is effectively trying to argue uh, is that uh, uh, allowing people to do that will also bring the same sorts of advantages as allowing them to think and discuss uh, doing that. We need to, we, we need to uh, precisely let people experiment at their own cost uh, because uh, uh, allowing people to experiment in this uh, in their own way with these personal beliefs and opinions um, is in fact a condition for autonomous self-exploration and uh, self-development. This will bring advantages to the community because this is how scientific discoveries and new technologies are generated. But even more importantly, it will bring huge benefits to the individual by enriching them, uh, making their life uh, 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 more fulfilled uh, and deep. Um, and, and, and in order to, to promote that ideal, and again, think about the higher pleasures, uh, we need to let individuals give them the freedom not just to think about doing certain things, but to let them do the things they're thinking about doing and resist the temptation uh, to restrict and interfere uh, and constrain and prohibit. Right, so that's that's the way these uh, arguments are roughly uh, uh, structured. So it's first an argument about thought and belief, and then an argument about well, if you buy that, uh, then we it sort of follows for some additional reasons and for some of the same reasons that we ought to uh, let people actually act on their convictions and 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 give them uh, the space uh, to act out their experiments in living, as Mill puts it, of course, famously. Now, uh, the arguments of these two uh, chapters uh, 
two and three, as you know, very, very complicated, especially the second chapter. There's an awful lot going on, tremendously rich, and I can't possibly summarize it all. I, I just want to tease out of uh, the arguments uh, three major and somewhat overlapping uh, uh, themes that I think are particularly worth uh, emphasizing in uh, Mill's case. Um, the first is that I want you to appreciate that Mill's argument depends on what you might say is the de-individualization uh, of rational belief as an activity. That's a horrible way to put it. But I, I want to put it that way because um, I think in the present climate, uh, this is a, one of Mill's most powerful uh, insights, right? I mean, these days, you know, people say stuff when, when, when they're criticized, right? They'll say stuff like, I'm entitled to my opinion, right? Fuck off, basically. Um, now, being entitled to one's opinion is, of course, probably in lots of ways uh, a reasonable thing to say, right? But we should ask, what does it really mean uh, to be entitled to your opinion? Um, and there's one possible meaning of that, that famous phrase that seems to me to be really dangerous and that Mill would certainly, and I think quite correctly, want to push back on, uh, namely that our beliefs are things to which we are entitled in the way that we're entitled to our personal property, right? So that, so that, so that my beliefs are kind of aspects of my uh, a portfolio of equipment and stuff that is mine, such that if you criticize my beliefs, you're doing something that is just as offensive, right, as taking away some property without my consent, right? And I think one of the things that Mill is, is particularly strong on is uh, trying to get you to see that our relationships to our rational commitments and beliefs is not proprietary uh, in that way. Uh, when I have my opinions, I don't have my truth in the way that I have my copy of Mills on Liberty, right? The relationship between those things is different. It's not proprietary. It's not possessive for reasons I'll get into, right? Because for Mill, rational belief, which uh, as I'll say in a moment, I think for him is much more an activity uh, than it is a kind of description of uh, a, 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 a set of propositions that someone actually holds, right? Uh, rational belief considered as a kind of activity, has social preconditions. And one of May Mill's major arguments, especially in chapter two, is that freedom of speech is one of the essential preconditions for the activity of rational believing uh, itself, right? Um, what he's thinking of here is that, look, except in cases like math, uh, and logic where, uh, you, you know, you, you can deduce certain conclusions just sort of internally from uh, certain axioms and definitions and premises. In, in almost all other areas, especially in areas with kind of ethical and political and moral uh, uh, import, uh, rational belief requires not just deduction of conclusions from within a closed set of assumptions, Right? It requires some conception of how one's opinions are confronted uh, by objections from other points of view. Right, That in virtually all cases of practical opinion and political opinion, that's the world in which we live. Right, We can't just deduce our opinions internally. We, we have to take our positions and understand them in relationship to some other point of view uh, uh, that is a source of possible objections to the way, the way we think, right? And Mill seems to be committed in these arguments in On Liberty to the View, uh, which seems to me to be broadly speaking right, that, we, that individual imagination alone is not generally enough to uh, make agents aware of the objections to which any view or opinion they might be attracted to uh, is liable, right? Uh, in the end, to be able to understand uh, uh, why one's opinions and beliefs might be problematic or open to criticism. Uh, one needs input, feedback, confrontation from devil's advocates or, or dissenters or others who see the matter differently um, in open discussion, right? Mill says, I don't have the page reference, but it's in there somewhere, three-fourths of the arguments for every disputed opinion consist in dispelling the appearances which favor some opinion different from it. He who knows only his side of the case knows little of that, right? So if you're going if, if to um, rationally believe your own opinions, right, it's no good just barricading yourself within 
a kind of completely self-sealed set of assumptions uh, that you may hold for existential reasons and that, you, and that you more and more identify yourself with as, you know, you know I'm a this, I'm a that, right? I'm a, I'm a you know, member of QAnon. These are my assumptions. This is where I stand, right? Um, and all I'm interested in is, you, you know, thinking about my opinions from within this little, this little epistemic, uh, epistemic bubble, Right, um, and I'm not going to, and I'm going to consider that point of view, that internal point of view, as infallible. Right, and if you criticize me, I'm never ever going to admit the possibility that you're, there might be something right about your uh, criticism. Mill thinks, look, if you're if you're barricaded in an epistemic bubble like that, you will not be able to rationally believe the things you believe, right? Because you're just making you're, you're making your rational beliefs into this kind of completely self sealed, self certain. Um, uh, a, a bubble, epistemic bubble, in which in which you're not willing to scrutinize those, those those beliefs, right? I mean, in fact, what he's saying is Christians need atheists because they won't be able to understand uh, the the nature of their commitments unless they expose their commitments to challenge from strong atheists like someone like Richard uh, Richard Dawkins, who's who's gone about the place for the last twenty years, uh, bleating about uh, how, how pathetic uh, religious people are. And Mill would say, "Well, Dawkins is no doubt wrong and crude, but it's it's very valuable if you're a Christian to be confronted with those objections, because by by reckon, uh, reckoning with Dawkins' objections, the Christian will deepen his own entitlement to his beliefs as rationally held." Right, um, and I take it that this is all fairly clear from the text. I won't, uh, I won't uh, uh, go on about this, and I'm running out of time. Uh, but I do want to emphasize one aspect of this: that uh, when this general approach leads Mill to say we shouldn't think of censorship as a private injury, right? It's not something that does a wrong to any given individual. The problem with censorship is that by depleting social discourse of uh, uh, the occasions for open, full, critical discussion, right? What censorship does is it denies us access to a common resource, uh, a common resource that we all need to be better rational believers. And that common resource, of course, is a source of objections, a source of understanding why somebody might not think uh, the, way, the way that we do ourselves right so so uh, that's why he says that censorship is a kind of theft of the commons it's not to be thought of as something like a, a, a an assault on one's own private identity right so all of this stuff about how dare you criticize me to you here today how dare you criticize me because this is my truth and i'm this is my identity and i'm going to stand on my identity millwood i think have hated that way of talking because it's not for him uh, about shoring up one's private identity and digging in uh, within some sort of uh, epistemic foxhole. Um, uh, rather, it's about securing common conditions under which all of us can confront objections openly and thereby cooperate in improving the way we think about our beliefs and, 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 and uh, uh, learning to become more self-critical uh, about it. Um, you know, this, of course, would require uh, people to occasionally admit that they might be wrong about something, which, of course, these days uh, virtually nobody does, which certainly indicates that we're very far from the kind of discourse that Mill uh, had in mind. Um, a second strand in Mill's argument that I want to pick out has to do with the value of error and the value, of, and it's related to what I just said in a way, right? the, the value of making mistakes. Right? Uh, Mill, I think, again, it inherits this a little bit from Hume and, and Bentham, uh, and maybe to a degree Smith and, and, and that sort of Adam Smith and that tradition. Um, uh, Mill assumes that human society progresses through trial and error, right? And the really progressive societies have been societies that have encouraged people to uh, uh, give give things a try, and not fear failure too much, right? Um, uh, because by failing, right, uh, the person who fails not only learns themselves about what not to do, but insofar as their failures are observed by others, then everybody else, you know, can learn from their mistakes, right? And, and society, Mill thinks, won't progress in that way unless we're in a position to learn from our mistakes, to learn from our errors, and in the end of the day, we won't learn from our errors unless we leave agents free to make them, right? Um, and, you know, uh, closing off experiments uh, 
because we're too afraid to make mistakes is he thinks in the long run a, a, a losing gambit, right? So, so part of what he's saying in, in, in encouraging a free and open uh, society is he wants to lift not just legal restrictions, but these kinds of psychological uh, restrictions on um, personal freedom that take the form characteristically of fear of transgression, right? And and we still, you know, we like to congratulate ourselves that we live in a tremendously uh, 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 free um, uh, uh, society. But fear of transgression is still uh, a major force, right, that we have to uh, reckon with, right? Um, I mean, all of us, you know, at some point in our lives, some of you already, uh, will, you know, confront well, maybe not all, but the vast majority of people, at some point confront the, the conflict between uh, living in a society in which you are expected, if you're in an intimate partnership with someone, uh, to be exclusive, right? Um, and the temptation to not be exclusive, right? Uh, all of us, well, most of us, are going to face something like that challenge. Um, and even today, people find it very, very difficult to talk openly about these questions, right? I mean, I think there's, there's a serious question. Why the norm of exclusiveness, right? What's it based on, right? Um, it's not completely obvious why any one person has the right to demand of another person that they never, ever, ever uh, think about having sex with anybody else, for example, right? I mean, it's familiar, but why do we make that expectation, right? Now, as you know, if you try to raise that philosophical question with, for example, your partner, right, the conversation is not likely uh, to go well, right? Um, and we avoid those conversations because we recognize that there's, there are all sorts of social norms and sanctions and taboos that you are transgressing if you, if you start having that conversation, right? That's why these conversations these days, to the extent that they happen at all, have to happen under the umbrella of confidentiality and, for example, a therapy session, right? I mean, it's a good question. Why do we have to have these conversations confidentially? If not that, there's a tremendous fear of talking about them openly, people knowing certain things about your attitudes. And I think Mill would say, look, this is not essentially different from the situation of a person who is living in a theocracy that is decided on certain kind of religious orthodoxies um, and basically bullies and cajoles informally uh, and, and formally people into not uh, uttering heretical beliefs, right? Um, and making people afraid to stick their ne neck up above the parapet and ask awkward questions. Like, well, really, what gives a human being the right to insist that somebody else never have sex with any other party or, or have sexual feelings of sexual attraction to somebody other than me, right? Um, it's a good question. But if you try to ask it, even under our current conditions, then 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 you're going to face a, 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 an awful lot of resistance, right? And Mill wants to say that we should lift the fear of that transgression as far as possible, because then, yes, it may be that may, maybe the norm is correct, but we're not really going to know unless we tr let people try uh, polyamory, for example, and see how it works out, right? And and maybe it's maybe it's a cul-de-sac, but if it is, we'll know that from the way in which uh, uh, things have actually worked out. But to, to do that, we've got to actually leave people free to do it. Um, okay, so there's some more things I've, I clearly need to say uh, about the uh, uh, these arguments in chapter two and three. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna stop now. There's one more set of things I wanna say about Mill's general case for uh, the harm principle, and I'll say that at the beginning of the next lecture. Uh, and then I'll spend the rest of that, that lecture talking about the harm principle itself um, and how it's supposed to work. But I think that is uh, enough for now. So thank you very much for listening. And again, I apologize for the slight delay in posting this one.